The hot lands of Mongolia, 72 million years ago. An area that even in the dry season has at least one constantly flowing river, making it similar to the Nile of the modern day. Much of the vegetation now only grows near the vast river, which means dinosaurs often congregate here as well. If not for food, then for shade. Commonly found are the herds of protoceratops, 2.5 meter long ceratopsians that are built for the tough desert. They live in family groups, unlike the ankylosaur Pinacosaurus, that lives solitary lives. In fact, it's far more common to see them mingling close to protoceratops herds than each other. As one group of the small ceratopsians rest in some shade, they notice a figure rising to the top of one of the sandy hills overlooking the riverside. At first glance, it looks like one of their own, but the size difference soon becomes clear, and the fact it has a much reduced neck frill, and a far larger lower jaw. Looming over the smaller herbivores is a male, Udantoceratops. Though related to them, he is 4 meters long and 700 kilograms, over 7 times the weight of even the heaviest Protoceratops. Female Udantoceratops live in small groups with their young, but males leave these family herds once reaching maturity and spend the rest of their lives alone. Steadily, the bull male marches down the hill towards the river, not caring who or what is in his path. Seeing the intimidating herbivore coming their way, all the Protoceratops anywhere near him stand up and clear the area, not wanting to be on the receiving end of those immense jaws of his. The Udantoceratops makes his way to the river without incident. They are right to fear his kind. The serrated edges of his beak are reinforced with bulky bone, and powered by thick muscles used to break into even the toughest of desert foliage, so he could easily snap limbs and bones if he chose to. This does mean that once he gets to the river, he has to not only get into the water, but submerge almost half of his head in order to get a drink. Not that he necessarily needs to. His body is built for the dry climate, and could go months without a drink. Having sated his thirst, the male lumbers back onto dry land and walks along the banks looking for food. There are plenty of plants here, and he is capable of feeding on just about all of them, but he is after something specific, something that doesn't grow out of the ground. Night begins to fall, and the Udanoceratops has been led far from the river into the more barren, rocky outcrops. Here, large life forms are more scarce, though the occasional Pinacosaurus do use the rocks as shelter. Patiently, he searches the area, knowing that what he is looking for will be here, as they have been in the past. Eventually, with the last of the sun's rays dipping below the horizon, he finds what he is looking for. A small dromaeosaur, Kurakula, is tending to her nest, made of an assortment of leaves and twigs. She has laid a dozen eggs over the past few days. Kurakula are only a meter long, and mostly feed on small mammals and reptiles. Her usual reaction to an animal the size of a new Dantoceratops is to give it as much space as possible. But she has to protect her nest, so upon seeing the heavy-set herbivore, freezes to not draw attention. But the Udanoceratops has seen her, and at this distance can even smell the freshly laid eggs, so knows exactly where they are. Ignoring the Kurakula, he trots towards the nest, and soon the mother dinosaur realizes his intentions. She lifts up her tail and expands her arms, puffing out her feathers before screeching loudly, trying to intimidate the Ceratopsian. Despite her bravery, it does nothing to slow down the herbivore turned nest raider. She is forced to back out of its path, flapping her arms and creating a racket, but to no avail. To both parties' surprise, the Kura's mate arrives in the nick of time. Jumping onto a rock that's slightly taller than the Udanoceratops, he then begins to squawk at the intruder while flapping his arms, and unlike his mate, 
gets the herbivore's attention. Turning his head slightly, the male Udantoceratops eyes the agitated Kurakula. He then faces his whole body towards the Dromaeosaur, and runs the short distance between them. Launching his upper body, he opens his jaws intending to snap up the annoying scavenger. With barely any time to react, the male Kura turns around and slides down the opposite side of the rock, the sharp beak of the herbivore almost scissoring his lightweight body in half. But he escapes, and the Udanoceratops ends up scraping his bottom jaw across the rock. A shallow cut is left along its surface, but the herbivore's beak isn't so much as chipped. With the annoyance running around to regroup of its mate, the Udanoceratops turns back to the nest. The parents continue to cry out, but they are helpless. Any physical attack they try could be fatal. Lowering his body, the Udanoceratops' mighty jaws aren't built for carefully plucking each egg individually, so he just scoops them up along with the rotting leaves and twigs. Sometimes he only gets one egg, others he gets two and some break spilling their contents onto the ground. He scoops and chomps away, eager to get the protein and nutrients the desert plants he usually eats can't provide. In about a minute, he has eaten all but two of the eggs. But either he doesn't notice them, or the ones he ate are enough. Rising to his feet, the Udantoceratops shakes himself off, and ignoring the still very loud Kurakula, walks away from the nest. With the threat gone, the Kura couple search the destroyed nest. They find the remaining two, and go about rebuilding with what they have. Fortunately, the female still has to lay another two eggs, bringing the total up to four. Perhaps they can raise some offspring, despite this early disaster. Night has now fallen, and the Udanoceratops hears a familiar sound. The loud snapping of a mighty beak being slammed against itself. It was the sound of a rival challenging him for territory. The male raised his head and clacked his beak in response, creating the same loud sound, and then marched to meet his rival. Perhaps another species needed to know the power of his bite. Hello fellow travellers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the mega-jawed Ceratopsian, Udanoceratops. The first remains of Udanoceratops were discovered in the Gobi Desert in the 1980s, and were named in 1992, and belong to the Jadakta Formation. The genus name is a combination of Udansea, which is the location the fossils were found, and Ceres meaning horn, and tops meaning face. The remains included a mostly complete skull and some vertebra, which was enough to identify it as a Ceratopsian, more specifically in the Leptoceratopsidae family. Udanoceratops is the largest known member of this family, being estimated to get to 4 meters in length and weigh up to 700 kilograms. It lived during the late Cretaceous between 86 and 72 million years ago. Looking at the skull, it was 60 centimeters long all on its own. We can see it does have a small frill on the back, but no horns over the eyes or on the snout. The top jaw ends in a large hooked beak, with teeth in the rear set in a curved position. The lower jaw is massive, ending in its own sharp beak, with teeth also set further back in an opposite curved position, so when the jaws closed, they interlocked. The thickness of the lower jawbone, and the strong muscles that were attached to it, would have given the animal an immense bite force, capable of cropping and shearing most vegetation before passing it into the back of the mouth where its thick teeth would have chewed and crushed just about anything before swallowing. The holotype has an injury to the skull, and though not confirmed, it's thought to have been made by another Udanoceratops. Without frills to display or horns to joust with, it's possible this species used their jaws as both display features to show how large and strong they were, and as weapons to bite down into rivals, 
or into any predators too slow to avoid the biological shears. Not a whole lot is known about the plants that lived in the area where Eudanoceratops was alive. But it was a desert environment, so it's likely it adapted such impressive jaws to break into even the toughest vegetation, ripping off bark and crushing nuts that few other animals could eat. Now let's talk a little bit more about Leptoceratopsidae. As said before, they are part of the Ceratopsia family, Though when you think of ceratopsids, you likely go to species like Triceratops, Styracosaurus, and Pentaceratops. Those are members of Ceratopsidae, being much larger and usually having much more elaborate horns and thrills. Those of Leptoceratopsidae were more basal and lived in North America, Asia, and possibly Europe, between 83 and 66 million years ago. Many are quite small, ranging from the 1.5 meter Helioceratops to the 2 meter long Leptoceratops, the namesake of the group. And as said earlier, the largest of the group being Eudanoceratops. While many have prominent crests and the signature powerful beak, none have any notable horns, and many of them are still bipedal, or were capable of bipedal movement. Together, they are seen as more basal than their larger horned relatives, but are also seen as more derived than the Cetacosaurs and other Neoceratopsids like Aquilops and Gracilaceratops. They likely filled a prominent niche in the Northern Hemisphere's small to medium-sized, tough herbivore niche. Udenoceratops is an excellent example of what some of the Ceratopsids were doing at this time while others were getting larger and evolving more elaborate frills and horns. Showing that across the family, one of the most defining features of them is in fact their jaws, which Eudanoceratops took to an extreme. The Leptoceratopsidae had quite massive heads overall, which while giving them the ability to tackle food sources other species couldn't handle, would have also been useful in predator defense. Some of the creatures it lived alongside include Protoceratops, another ceratopsid, Velociraptor, a dromaeosaur, Panacosaurus, an ankylosaur, and Cryptobata, a multi-tuberculate mammal. To me, Eudanoceratops looked like one of those herbivores that were quick to anger, and if you disturbed it, you'd know about it very quickly. No doubt if it was around today, there would still be people who think it's friendly just because it's a herbivore. Ever seen those videos of people that try to pet or take photos with wild bison or moose, or even cattle, and then quickly find out? Yeah, that sort of energy. But what do you think of Eudanoceratops? And for my question of the week... Do you believe that Ceratopsians needed to grow larger horns and frills as they themselves grew larger? Or was this more due to them being used in display and courtship? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.